I'm delighted to be with you here again. It's Mentor Day. And have you ever noticed how we individually um, experience different emotions and feelings whenever we talk about the word money? Well, that is what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes. Um, I believe that one of the things that you must study and have an understanding of if you want to become wealthy is money because there is a science to getting rich there is a, um, a language there is a vocabulary of wealth and more importantly um, money is a study and if you can combine those three areas I just mentioned what you find is that your financial dreams your desires your hopes um, your aspirations for the future become a reality very easily so in the next few minutes I'm going to be talking to you about the subject of money now it's a very very volatile and very sensitive subject um, various emotions and feelings come out when I would talk about money you talk to some people about money and they they believe that money is the root of all evil you talk to another group of people and they think money is the best thing that ever happened to them so it all depends on what side of the coin you're looking at what I found is that money is neither good or bad but your thinking makes it so your experiences from your past your experiences in the present have formed and conditioned you on how you see and how you view money now I have a strong belief about what and how we should use money it's not my intention to in some way pass on the belief to you in the next few minutes but what I'd like to do is just share with you some of the philosophies and and the beliefs that are shared amongst the wealthy and the rich not necessarily so you can adopt them probably more so to enable you critique where you are in life your beliefs and decide for yourself whether um, a change is required now I'll start by making a statement depending on where you find yourself today I don't know where I've met you perhaps um, you're financially free you're wealthy you're rich and you don't actually need um, any more I found um, that it's almost impossible to find someone who has so much that they do not need any more it was um, J Paul Getty um, who was asked the question you know how much more will it take to satisfy you and he said just a little bit more now that is a mistake on my part I think it was uh, it was John D Rockefeller not J Paul Getty he said just a little bit more now at that point in time he was the wealthiest man in the world but he said if he could just have a little bit more he would be satisfied now in the same way I have never found and I don't think I would ever find or meet someone who believes that they have enough and they want no more now part of the reason for that is because everything created by life is seeking to express itself more and more if you look at the plants if you look at the trees if you look at nature nature is always trying to become the most and the best that it can be now the same mind that created the beautiful universe that you see is the same mind that created you and myself and there is something in us and that's called a desire what is a desire? A desire is simply an unexpressed feeling that is within you seeking to be expressed without and trying to use you as a channel for its expression it's really what a desire is and I've found from my experience but also from interacting with various people around the world that we all have a desire a desire for more now many of us are content with what we have but guess what in life if you're not growing you're dying there is no such thing as staying in the same even place you cannot remain the same it's a, it's a law of life just like you have the laws of gravity you're either creating or you're disintegrating um, and so the desire you have within you the desire I have within me for more is natural It's something we should embrace now let's get back to the topic about money let me
me start by saying this. If you want to be wealthy, if you want to um, achieve your financial dreams, if you want to make a difference in the world, if you want to be more generous and benevolent, you've got to learn and understand money. Now what puzzles me is that the average person spends about 40 hours every week, um, which is in many cases um, equivalent to about 70% of your waking day if you take into account and consideration traveling to work and traveling back from work and preparing for work, we spend about 70% of our waking day focused on trying to earn more money. On average, over a lifetime, we'll spend about 50 years of our life working for money. And what puzzles me is that although we spend all of this time, energy and effort working for money, very few have taken the time to really study the one thing that they exchange a portion of their life for. If you want to be wealthy, you've got to be a master of money. It's really that simple. You've got to master it. Now, to master money is very simple. Now, I'll start by giving you a very interesting um, concept about money because I believe that money is simply an idea. What we call money is really um, defined as a currency. Now, I'm going to show you two different um, currencies and I'm going to ask you to choose which um, perhaps you would um, select if I gave you the option of having one of either. Now, in my left, in my right jacket pocket, I have um, a stack of money. It's roughly about a hundred um, notes in my left, I have, again, a stack of money, it's roughly about 100 notes. However, on the right side, I have 100,000. On the left side, I have 500. Now, if I were to ask you to choose whether you wanted the money on the right or whether you want the money on the left, which would you choose? Now, it's not a trick question. Now, most people would go for the hundred thousand and I would understand that but what if I said to you that there was something that I left out in the explanation what if I said to you that what I had in my right pocket was a hundred thousand but it was a hundred thousand in a different currency as a matter of fact this is a hundred thousand in African currency this is 100 notes 1,000 each which comes up to 100,000. So in this hand, I have 100,000. Now, if you've gone for this, you may be excited by what you get. However, um, the equation is not complete. Now, to explain that in a different way, let me start by saying this. Everything in life, everything in life comes as a part of something else. So what I gave you, the information I gave you, was, was correct, but it was incomplete. Now, because there was a missing piece of the information I gave you, what you find is that the outcome, which is the decisions you may have made, um, could have been different. I started by saying I had a thousand, um, or sorry, a hundred notes in my right pocket. And this was in my right pocket. And this is a hundred thousand. If you'd gone for that option, I would have been handing you a hundred thousand. In my left pocket, on the other hand, I have a different currency. The currency I have in my left pocket is, again, one hundred in terms of notes. However, it's simply five hundred. Now, the reason this is still in the wrap is because what I have in my right hand now is the new five pound currency. It's never been used before. This particular one has never been used. It's still in the, um, it's still in the print and in the mint that you would normally get from the vaults. Um, so, had I given this to you, you would have been the first person who ever got to touch the currency. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at the serial numbers, it goes to 000007, which tells you there's one of the first currencies that was a uh, 
ever printed in this denomination. So in my second hand I have 100 notes is my left pocket and this is 500. Now most people would have gone for the first because it says it's 100,000. Very few would have gone for the second. You see the difference is one of them is in pounds, the other is in an African currency. Interestingly, the pounds currency was the, is the oldest currency um, that exists today, that currently exists. What is remarkable is this 100,000 is worth less than the 500. And part of the reason for that is simply because in this hand, although I have 100,000, if you converted it to pound sterling, this is only roughly about 220 pounds. So if you took the 100,000 pounds, you would only be worth 220 pounds. If you took the 500 pounds, you would have been worth 500 pounds. Now, I use that example simply to explain a principle. And the principle is simply that what we think of money is simply an idea. What we call money is just an idea. Um, when we say money, most of us have in our minds a currency. But money is not only a currency. See, everything is money. Your time is money. Your smile is money. Your intellect, your intelligence, your wisdom is money. Everything around you can be converted to money. See, money is simply an idea. It's just an idea. If you can take that idea and you can put it in a form that people can understand and you can use that to create value for people, then what people do is they give you in exchange for that value you've created, they exchange some currency with you. So understanding money is really important, but even more so understanding currencies is very important. Now, why did I use this example to get things started? I'll explain. Part of the reason I use the example is simply to demonstrate to you that what we call money is not really what we think it is. If you want to be wealthy, you've got to understand currencies. Now, the, the 500 pound notes I had, and I still have, although it's worth more than the African currency, the 500 pounds, the pound currency is no longer backed by gold. The African currency I have is not backed by gold either. If you travel to a different continent, if you look at the American do dollars, in 1971, the American dollars was no longer stopped. It stopped being backed by gold. The problem is, because all of these currencies are no longer being backed by gold, the various banks that represent, maybe the continent or represent um, a general um, financial, you might call it world, like the Federal Reserve Bank, they have a right to print as much as they can. Now the reason the African currency is worth less than the pound sterling is because a lot of this has been printed and every time you print more of this, the value of each reduces. So I say that for a simple reason. If you're focusing on trying to earn a currency, you might want to think again and ask yourself, what is the value of a currency that I'm working so hard to acquire and what will it be worth in 10 years time? You see, if I sat with you and you said to me that you earned a million pounds in 2017, I wouldn't be excited. I would simply say to you, come back to me in 10 years and tell me how much you have in 10 years and I will tell you how much you earned in 2017. Now I say that simply because every single year, the more we print the currency, the more the currency is devalued. Now what does this all mean 
And why is it necessary or important for wealth? It's very good you ask that question. You see, there are a few, there are very few ways through which the money you have or you want to acquire can be protected. One of them is through what I call gold. The world also calls it gold. The other is called silver. Now these are all commodities. Um, gold is not consumable, which means that all of the gold that has ever been discovered in the world is still here today. Now, we have 7,000 years um, of recorded history um, and all of the gold is still here on earth. So for those who think that there is a short supply of money or wealth, think again. This is all here. Silver, on the other hand, is a perishable commodity, which means that it goes and it is based on a demand supply principle. It's very attractive because there is a demand for it and because it's consumable. Um, as we consume more silver, what we have left will be a lot more expensive. Now, the third is what I call real estate. The reason I use the word real estate is simply because I, I wanted to cover the likes of land and property. Now, I can give you a few more commodities, but I'm going to stop with this three. And the point I'm trying to make with this is your financial intelligence is really important in creating wealth. The reason your financial intelligence is critical is because the wealthy do not save currency. They do not save currency. What the wealthy do is they have a very, very, very strategic way of converting whatever currency they have into a different form. You must convert the currency you have into a different form. So if you look at the butterfly, the butterfly is a regenerated state of the insect. Before that is a caterpillar. A caterpillar has to die to its old self to become its new self, a butterfly. Now in the same way, wealth is created, wealth is multiplied, wealth is protected, wealth is passed on through financial understanding and wisdom. And that wisdom is what guides you on how to store your wealth. The wealthy do not hold money in currency. Part of the reason is simply because the banks are printing so much of it and the value keeps going down. This 500 pounds I have in my pocket right now can buy me so much today. If I were to go back 10 years ago, it could buy me much more. Some might say it's inflation. Some might say, well, the value has gone down. It really doesn't matter what the cause is. The truth is that the value will continue to go down. So one of the most important things you've got to understand about money is everything I've written here on this board is money. Everything on this board is money. So to become financially intelligent, you've got to ask yourself questions. How do I convert the currency I have into something that is more stable? Because stability is crucial on the wealth path, trying to become wealthy or rich. Now I started by talking about emotions that we have when we talk about money. And a lot of that come from, in some cases, our upbringing, you know. If you grew up like I did, I was raised by two incredible parents. Um, we were wealthy based on our principles and the attitude we had towards life. We were wealthy based on hope and the dreams we had of the future. We were wealthy because we just had a positive mental attitude and we had great philosophies and founded our life and our futures on, on you know, the, the thinking that has made me who I am today. However, 
we were financially poor. You know, there were days when, you know, if I had two meals in a day, I consider that day to be an exciting and a very good day. We were financially poor. Now, part of the reason for that, looking back, is simply that we didn't have a good understanding about wealth. We weren't very well educated on the wisdom necessary to create, multiply, and pass on wealth. And in the last few years, I started studying the subject of wealth. And the more I studied wealth, the more I came to understand that what I knew about money, what I knew about wealth, was very different um, to the way the wealthy and the rich viewed and how they lived. And I started to question some of my beliefs. I started to question some of my old paradigms. I started to question some of my philosophies about life particularly in the area of money. And the more I studied, the more I could see something that was very clear. And that was simply that my results and the results I had in my life were a reflection of who I was. It was really that simple. It had nothing to do with the government. It has nothing to do with my, um, my, my, um, my company, who I work for. It had nothing to do with the people around me. It had nothing to do with the economy. It was all down to me. And so I came to the conclusion that to change the outcomes in my life, I had to change myself. I couldn't wait for the government to change. I couldn't wait for the banks to change. I couldn't wait for the weather to change or for people to change because I had no control over all of those. And in the same way, I want to pass that same wisdom to you. That for things to change in your life, you have to change. And that change begins with recognizing and accepting that you're responsible. You see, if I see myself as the one who is responsible, then I can change immediately. On the other hand, if I see someone else as responsible, then I have to wait for them to change, for my circumstances to change. Now, this is what you have to do if you want to understand money. You've got to understand a few things. There are laws of money or you might say laws of wealth there are myths of money and myths of wealth there are beliefs and philosophies of money and wealth and there are rules Of money. Now why am I talking about these? I think it's important because um, I found from my experience that I was held back for so long because number one I didn't understand the laws of wealth. I didn't understand the laws of money. I didn't recognize early enough that the way I lived my life were based on some of the myths of money on wealth. Number three, the beliefs and the philosophies I had were wrong. And finally, number four, I didn't recognize and I couldn't understand or see that making money was simply a game. And like every game, there are rules. And if you know the rules, you play the game well. You can choose who you play against. You can choose your team. You can choose even the outcomes of the game. You see, many people are living in such a way that they don't understand the game of money and they don't understand the rules. And as a result of that, you have amateur players playing against professional players. The banking systems are professionals. The governments are professionals. Now, the difference between the wealthy and the poor, and I don't say that lightly because I believe that all of us are born rich. By that statement I mean that we have the potential to be rich. But the difference between the poor and the wealthy is simply that the wealthy understand the rules of the game. So they play the game to win. I'll give you a good example of what that means. The wealthy understand the value and the importance of financial wisdom. 
and they equip themselves with so much wisdom and because of that knowledge they're able to achieve their goals one of the biggest challenges we have with the poor and uh, the destitute is simply a lack of wisdom it's ignorance you know one of my favorite um, authors says that people perish for lack of wisdom and so the wealthy have the rules and because they know the rules they win now you've heard this said before he who has the gold makes the rules what they've done is they've studied the game they've played the game they have the gold now they're making the rules so if you want to become wealthy you've got to deal with this four key areas and I'm going to talk about the four of them in the next 10 minutes very briefly and I hope it helps now let me start by saying this this statement may not really um, sit well with a lot of people now I can make this statement and I can say that proudly and I can say with some level of authority because I was born um, into a very financially poor and destitute family um, the environment I was raised in we were poor the environment was poor um, everyone around us was in the same position now how could I have gone from where I was born to where I am now financially free um, and happy and living a more fulfilled life it has to do with the power of choice and making a decision so the statement I want to make is this I believe it's a sin to be poor that's my opinion you don't have to accept it but I believe it's a sin to be poor because there is no reason for anyone to be poor you weren't born poor poverty is a choice I can say that like I said because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a I still see myself sometimes the image I have I have to keep renewing my mind and pushing away that image of the poor African boy who was born with nothing but poverty is a choice we're all born into various circumstances and environments some environments are more favorable than others however what I found with life is that life is fair irrespective of where you were born where you were raised who you are the family you grew up in life will present you with an opportunity an opportunity to change your future and change your destiny at that point where the opportunity is presented you automatically now have to exercise the most important gift you have the power of choice the gift of the free will to choose what you want to become to choose who you want to become to choose what you want to have coming from an African country one of the things I found is that we we fail to recognize that freedom comes with responsibility we want to be free in the Western world everyone wants to be rich everyone wants to be happy everyone wants to be wealthy but very few people want to accept the responsibility required for that freedom I've traveled around the world and I've found from my travels that, and this is quite interesting coming from Africa coming from a poor continent um, as many people think we are is that in the Western world where you have people who have been born into free countries I found that amongst all of the many countries I've gone to that very few people are free everyone professes to be free however their working hours when they go to work is dictated by someone else when they take their holidays is dictated by someone else where they go sometimes is often dictated by someone else how long they work is dictated by someone else most people are working to make other people's dreams a reality most people are too busy earning a living that they haven't taken out the time to design their own life now I call that slavery you might call it occupational slavery or economic slavery but most people are not free in a free country most people are not free and I came to the conclusion that if you live in a free country you were born in a free country you live in a free country and you're not financially free or wealthy at age 30 it's not the government 
It's not the state of the economy. It's not bad luck. It's not fame, fortune. It's not destiny. It's you. It's simply that you do not have a plan to be wealthy. So, taking a back a step now, I'm going to give you four different areas that you must consider when you're dealing with money that can help you become wealthy. Let's start with the laws. Laws of money. I'm going to give you three key laws of money. Very simple, very effective. The first is creation. The second is multiplication. The third is protection. You've got to create wealth, you've got to multiply your wealth, and you've got to protect your wealth. There are various laws that um, support the foundations of these three key areas. Creation. What does it mean to create? What does the law of creation of money refer to? It simply means that the level of money you have is a reflection of the level of service you're providing to people. If you're poor, it's simply a reflection that you're not providing enough service to people. Like I said to you, all of the wealth, all of the gold that has been in the world since the world began or begun is still here. So the question about availability is not, um, should not even be discussed. To create wealth, you've got to understand that compensation, what you get, what people give you in terms of money, is always in proportion to the service you provide. Now I like what Bob Proctor says, he says, the law of compensation states that your level of compensation will be in direct proportion to three things, the need for what you do, your ability to do it and do it exceptionally well with excellence, and the challenge or the difficulty there will be in replacing you. Now I take it a step further by saying this. If you want to be wealthy, if you want to create wealth, you've got to look for people that you can serve. Um, you know, a great master once said, if you want to become the greatest, you have to be the least, you have to be the servant, you have to serve people. If you serve people, and you serve them well, you solve problems for people, people will compensate you. It's a law. So if you do not have wealth, or you're not wealthy, and you do not have money, just take a step back and ask yourself a simple question. How much value am I creating for people? So wealth creation begins with recognizing that you already have what you need to create wealth. Now many of you watching this might think and say, I don't really understand, I don't believe in, I have nothing, you know, I met someone who said I have nothing, you know, you know, life is not being fair on me. Let me give you, let me take you back in time and give you what I call a eureka moment in my life, because I was the one who always used to think that life dealt me a bad card. You see, life deals you the cards. As soon as you have the cards in your hands, you get to choose whether you play. And if you don't like the card that has been dealt, you can reject the card and you can ask for another one. So you have all that you need to become wealthy. Every one of us has been endowed with so much potential that it's almost a sin. Not even almost, it is to become wealthy. Now when I use that word sin, I don't use that word in a religious context. Now, I made reference to it a few minutes ago, but let me clarify. If you've ever either watched or observed um, the game of archery, the word sin comes from archery. It simply means that you've missed the mark. So normally in archery, you have the bullseye, you have the exact target that the participant or contestant is trying to aim for. Now when they release the shots, if they miss the mark, the target, 
they call it sin which means you've missed the mark now each and every one of us has a mark a target we've been given all these gifts this greatness this potentiality that is unlimited and every time we live our life in any way that is less than what we were born to be we've sinned we've deviated from what is expected look around nature everything created is always trying to become the best it can be you know a dog wants to be the best dog it can be a lion has to become the best lion it can be you know everything a plant a seed everything becomes the best that they can be it's only when you come to human beings that we feel less and we achieve less than we can simply because we have the power of choice yes we do not have that instinct that animals have we have something much greater which is the free will now for those of you who are thinking you don't have what it takes to create wealth let me just share with you a life-changing moment um, that happened to me I came to the realization that that there are no victims in life we are all volunteers now this was such a difficult statement for me to accept there are no victims in life we are all volunteers because I was born poor and born you know in a poor part of Africa I always used to think that it had to do with destiny and fate and I felt that you know, the gods um, whatever them, that might be to you whether you believe in one or don't or whatever you believe that there is one God I just felt that life had dealt me a bad card and I could come up with a thousand reasons why things hadn't worked out for me and every time I used up all of my reasons I came up with another thousand you see the mind is so powerful the mind will give you all of the excuses you want if you give it the opportunity to do that for you but one evening I came to the realization that it wasn't anything outside that I was dealing with the effect of things and looking at the effect but I had to go down to the cause you see if you don't have money that is not your problem that is a symptom that you have a problem and so I went back into myself and I said what is the problem now the more I started to dig deep to understand why my results were they were, were what they were I realized that it was all me that I was the lowest common denominator in all the equations in my life and so I played a part more importantly that nothing could happen in my life without my consent in other words I was responsible and the more I started to study me the more I realized that I had everything I needed and you have the same you have a brain to guide you help you make decisions you have a mind and an imagination an imagination that can create any future you want you have a heart to help you guide and make the right decisions and to communicate with your mind and your body you have a conscience that acts as a, a, a referee a guiding system to tell you when something doesn't look right you have intuition you have all these mental faculties that would help you become the best that you can be in addition to that it doesn't just stop there you also have all of the wisdom of the world available in books, audio, video, training um, 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 support systems that you can refer to. You have other wealthy people, people who are happy, people who have achieved the good life, who you can use as models. You can model yourself on them. See, the more I looked at all of these, I realized I had everything I needed. So I could create wealth. You create wealth by serving people. And so I started to ask myself the question, how can I serve more people? As a matter of fact, I think if you wake up every morning and if you go to bed every evening with this question, in a few years, your life will never be the same. That question is simply this. When you wake up in the morning, ask yourself, what can I do today to serve more people and serve them exceptionally well? At the end of the day, ask yourself the same question. What can I do tomorrow to improve on the level of service I created for people and the value I added to people's lives? 
what extra can I do to make their lives better? Yeah. Now, that deals with creating wealth. So, we all can become wealthy because we all can create wealth. You want to create wealth, you want to be compensated, solve more problems for people, and do it so well, do it with so much excellence and mastery that people stop. People literally stop and awe at how well you are at your craft. The second law is multiplication. Now once you have a seed, a seed has to multiply. Now what people don't understand is that there is a law of multiplication. Everything in life seeks to improve. If I take a seed and I put a seed in soil, it will not remain as a seed. It will multiply to become a tree. It will multiply to become an orchard of trees from one seed. However, that seed has to be put in the right environment. And so wealth is created and multiplied by understanding the wisdom required to position what you have as a seed in a location where it can multiply. The difference between people who are wealthy and people who are not comes down to one simple word. M S I. That means multiple sources of income. Now, to explain this in a very simple way, imagine a golden goose. The golden goose is your seed. You get a golden goose. Your responsibility is to nurture and protect that goose. And then let that golden goose lay some geezes. Now, it, lays, it starts by laying an egg. The problem most people have is that they cannot get over the instant gratification experience. So as soon as an egg is laid, they eat the egg. Some other people actually eat the egg and sell the golden goose. And so they have nothing. The wealthy and the smart and the financially intelligent, what they do is they protect the golden goose so that it can continue to produce eggs. When the eggs are laid, they protect the eggs. They guard the eggs. With time, the eggs will hatch. Now you have a number of geeses. Now they protect the geeses nurture the geeses until the geeses get to the point where they can now produce their own eggs and so for one goose you have perhaps 10 geeses now you have 10 gooses who are now producing more eggs and so it continues to compound it simply follows the principle of compounding you take the return you have you don't eat it you reinvest it you create multiple sources of income the key to wealth is recognizing that you must have multiple sources of income. About 97% of the population do something that is very different from the remaining 3% of the population when it comes to money. On average, we spend a lifetime, like I said, um, about 50 years of our life working for money. Most of us, most people are slaves to money. Most people are working for this. Most people work for this. We are slaves to money, which is very sad, but that's the truth. The wealthy have understood the concept that if you work for money, you will always be a slave to money. And so what they do is they get this money to work for them. Very simply, how? What you earn, you take a portion of what you earn and you invest. It's like a golden goose. You buy a golden goose and then you protect the goose. When the goose starts to produce more and more eggs, you have more and more geese, then they're working for you. You're no longer working for money. That is simply a very sim basic fundamental principle about money. And the way you do that is simply multiple sources of income where whilst you're sleeping your money is multiplying whilst you're playing and having fun with your family your money is multiplying now i've been i've been speaking to you for for about 40 minutes now i believe and um, in the 40 minutes i've been speaking my investments are making me money so whilst i'm talking to you my investments are making me money that is multiple sources of income 
So it has nothing to do with me investing my own time. Whether I sleep or I you know, decide to play or I work, I'm making money. Very important. Now let's talk about the next, which is protection. Warren Buffett is considered to be the greatest, probably the greatest investor of the 21st century. And he has a rule for investing. He says, rule number one, never, never lose money. That's his first rule. You never lose money. Now, rule number two, he said, is never forget rule number one, which is simply trying to say the most important rule is you don't lose your money. You don't lose the capital. So part of the reason why wealth is created and multiplied and passed on is because those who are wealthy understand the principle of protection. How do I protect what I have? How do I build a fortress of protection around what I've created so that I don't lose it? If you understand that concept, then you understand and you have what it takes to be wealthy. See, most people get their paycheck. Now, I should have started with this. Um, but let me write it anyway. Most people start with a paycheck and when they receive a paycheck, they don't understand the purpose for money. So as soon as the money comes in, everything goes away. They lose everything. Paying bills, buying things they want, everything is gone. Now let me give you um, a formula which I think will serve you very well. This is a formula for wealth and a formula for poverty. The formula for wealth is simply this. Wealthy people, they earn, from what they earn, they discount or they invest first whatever they have left. They do two things. They spend and, if they need to, they save. Very simple. The wealthy earn, they invest first. Once they're done investing, that takes them into the next step, which is now we can spend. And whatever is left, we save. And whatever we save, we put it back into investing. The poor people, on the other hand, or the poverty equation is this, they earn, Still the same amount of money. What they do is they spend. And therein lies the difference. They spend first. And what they have left, if any, they save. It's the same money, the same amount of effort by two different people. But the philosophy is different. If you're going to learn how to protect your money according to the laws of wealth, you must learn how to protect what you earn. And the way you protect what you earn is by going for smart investments. Investments whereby you take a portion of what you have, you invest it smartly, wisely, and you make sure that you never lose what we call your seed capital, which is the seed you have in the ground. It's like a farmer. If you walk to a farmer and say to the farmer, why don't we have your seed corn for dinner? then he's going to think you're crazy because he understands the principle of protection. He understands the laws. You cannot eat the seed. The seed has to go back into the soil to produce a harvest. The harvest, you can have some of it, but you can't have all of it. Now that deals with laws. Now let's move quickly to the myths. I'm going to give you only three myths very quickly. Now, if you like anything that I'm saying here, um, I think in the myths section, I'm talking, you must forgive me, I'm talking and I'm teaching from, from this book. It's called Unstoppable. If you do not have a copy, it's worth, it's worth the investment. You know, I consider authors to be um, the cheapest way of hiring a researcher. You know, an author can spend a lifetime coming up with ideas and, and um, principles that have changed their life. They can document it in a, in a short book. And for nine pounds, for 10 pounds sometimes, you can buy what took someone 15 years to learn. You have the equation in front of you 
you apply the same process you get the same result so I think for many of us and I love reading for many of us I see authors as simply the best investment I can make because I'm simply hiring someone to do the research for me and present it in such a way that I can take the information apply it to my life and get the same results so I'll say if you do not have this book it's worth getting now I'm teaching from a section in the book um, in the book I'm teaching particularly now I'm gonna be talking about the myths and I'm talking I think it's from um, chapter 4 let me just find this yes chapter 4 um, chapter 4 from unstoppable now let's get back to what I was saying what are the myths to wealth I'm gonna give you three just three um, the first myth about wealth is simply the definition. The definition. Now, what does that mean? If I walked along the high street in any city in the UK and I stopped anyone, and this probably would be the same in any country in the world, if I stopped anyone randomly and said, what do you consider wealth to be? What is your definition of wealth? Most people have a picture in their mind of all the yachts, the luxury lifestyle, the cars, the mansions, the private jets, the beautiful women, the beautiful men, all of the accessories and all of the gadgets. But it's, there's nothing farther from the truth. You see, wealth is connected to a word we call freedom. Financial freedom. And what is financial freedom? Because that is the basis for understanding wealth. Financial freedom is simply arriving in a place whereby you do not have to work, only by choice, but you do not have to work for necessity because you have investments that can provide you with an income to enable you maintain the standard of living you choose. So simply, you're financially free when you're able to live on the income from your investments and you no longer have to work and that is a you know an infinite time frame that is wealth wealth most people think of wealth and they have pictures in their minds of um, a financial statement with a number of zeros and a number of commas so they're thinking about millions and millions and I keep saying to people that could be the vision but in reality, you've got to understand that it's a lot easier to become financially free and wealthy. You know, because that desire in you will always be for more, you've got to understand that to get into the freedom island or the wealthy club, you need much less. So the first myth is about the definition of what wealth is. Most people don't understand what it means to be wealthy or financially free. I've just explained the definition to you. And what I'm simply saying as I summarize that first myth is simply the definition of wealth that most people have is not only wrong, it's obsolete and is incorrect. Wealth is simply where you get to a point where the income from your investments are able to provide you with a consistent level of lifestyle or even better such that you no longer have to work and that is infinite wealth has less and that many cases has nothing to do with your net worth now I'll deal with this in a different session the mistake most people are doing is they're trying to become net worth in terms of their financial position no it's very different from wealth Wealth is measured in income. Your net worth is measured in, in most cases, frozen assets or measured in monetary terms that is maybe frozen in a, an investment. And let me move quickly to the second myth and then I'll bring all of it together very quickly. The second myth is how, how it's measured. Now I just started to talk about that briefly. The first thing to say is this. Wealth is measured in money as a function of time. 
not money alone. So if you walked up to me and you said, my net worth is 10 million pounds. My first question to you will be, what is your monthly available cash flow? What is the income you're generating from that asset you have, all those investments you have? If your answer is nothing, then I'll simply say to you that your net worth is worth nothing right now. Simply because net worth that cannot be converted to cash flow, net worth that cannot be converted to income means nothing. It's of no use. Now think about it this way. If you were hungry and you came to visit me and you were so, so famished, you're really hungry, and I went into the kitchen and I brought out um, maybe a very nicely cooked meal that was in the freezer, it was frozen, um, sub-zero temperature, and I put it on the table for you and I said, this is a, a beautifully cooked uh, meal from a very good chef. You can have it. Now, the meal is frozen, so it's of no use to you. It cannot satisfy your desire at that point in time. The only time it becomes valuable to you is if you can take it from a frozen sub-zero temperature and bring it into a temperature that is edible. That's when it becomes valuable. So in many cases, most people's net worth is simply frozen in assets. Part of the reason is because they do not intend to get rid of the assets. Now, if you're willing to sell your assets, then yes, you have a value in terms of equity that is available, and that might last you a certain time. But if you're intending to hold onto the asset and it's not producing an income, then it means very little in the present. So, wealth is one of the myths is on how it is measured. Wealth is measured in money as a function of time. Let me go a little bit deeper with that. Let's assume, for example, that you have an asset, an investment, and that investment pays you £1,200 every month. Every month, it pays you 1200 every month. Let's also assume that your monthly expenses, your liabilities, your expenses, everything, to live the life you you want to live, to do everything you want to do, let's assume that is a thousand pounds. What this means that is every month you have a 200 pounds net balance, extra. Simply put, you're wealthy. Now if this investment you have continues to pay you this income and providing that whatever it pays you exceeds your expenses, then your, your wealth has no limits in terms of time it will continue until and even beyond your death because you have a secure investment producing uh, a, a secure monthly income source, cash flow into you, and your expenses, even if they increase, you're guaranteed that whatever investment you have will, will, will exceed, in terms of income, what you're spending, then you're wealthy. You're wealthy. And you can calculate this by simply saying, what is the ratio of my income to my expenses and that gives you what we call your wealth ratio very simple on the other hand if you have an asset or an investment that is worth a million pounds for example let's assume it's worth a million pounds let's assume that you do not decide to sell and it's not producing an income, then you're not wealthy because it means you still have to work for you to pay your expenses. You're not financially free. You still have to work. You're still dependent on money. On the first explanation, you're independent, you're free. You don't have to work. With the first, you have a net worth that is a million, and that's, you know, that's a considerable amount, but you need to work. You're still dependent on money. On that basis, you're not wealthy. You're not wealthy. Your, 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 your net worth is frozen. Yes, you have a high net worth, no problem. But you're not wealthy because you have no income. Wealth is income. 
wealth is not amounts. Um, you know, it, it all depends on whether you want to be asset rich or cash flow income rich. It's all, it's all a matter of choice. If on the other hand you decided I'm going to sell this assets and you're trying to find out, okay, if I sold the assets and I've got my one million pounds, what will be my wealth in terms of time? You go back to the same equation. You got a thousand pounds expenses per month. So it means that if you spend a thousand pounds per month from your one million, what you will have is you have a thousand months that that wealth will last for you you're a thousand months wealthy very simple so i've given you two examples of um the myths that we normally have when we talk about um when we talk about wealth now if you want any more information on this you've got to get this book because there's so much content that i cannot go through um, in the next few minutes, I'm just limited on time, and um, and and therefore, you know, I'm not going to spend or waste your time going through every single thing. Um, by all means, if you have any questions, you can always write to me and ask me. Um, you know, share the questions and opinions you have, and I'll do my best to get back to you. The final and the third reference to wealth or myth so i've talked about two number one is definition number two is how is measured number three in terms of myth is in terms of when most people think you've got to retire to be wealthy you know i'm going to work all of my life when i retire at 65 then i'll be wealthy i'll say this most people who are retired are not financially free and many people who are financially free are not retired. So your retirement age has nothing to do with your level of wealth. And secondly, you do not have to work until you're 65 to be financially free. I was financially free by age 30. And three years after that, at 33, I retired from my engineering profession. And that allowed me to dedicate the rest of my life towards living a purpose-driven and fulfilled life, doing what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, with whom I wanted to do it with. That meant I no longer had to work or be a servant or slave to money, but now I had money working for me through investments. Now, in addition to that, what it helped me do was it allowed me to focus on the second law of wealth, which is multiplication, I could now channel all of my time and resources to creating multiple sources of income. Now, I explained that simply to make a point. You do not have to walk all your life, get to 65, and then retire on a rocking chair. That is a, a very old kind of myth about wealth. Interestingly, a lot of people who are retired are not financially free. And... Many people who are financially free are not retired. So your, your age has no bearing. It has nothing to do with when you become financially free. Wisdom is what makes you financially free. Your ability to take knowledge, get educated, take the knowledge, understand the information, and apply it in such a way that you produce the outcomes that you expect for your life. When you retire, it's dependent on you. It has nothing to do with time. It has nothing to do with the economy. It depends on how quickly you set your goals, how disciplined you are in sacrificing um, the necessary things that are, are needed to get you to your financial destiny. Now, that concludes the myths of wealth. Now, let's go very quickly into the beliefs and the philosophies because this is where everything starts to change and shift. There's a difference between your beliefs and your philosophies. Now, your, your beliefs are simply habitualized thoughts. Habitualized thoughts. Your philosophies are simply how you process your thoughts. Your philosophy deals with how you think. Your beliefs deal with what you believe, and this is believe with a 
you know, E, V, E, what you believe from those thoughts are true. So, with both of them, what you have in common are your thoughts. Your thoughts. Now, your thoughts are so important because who you are today is a reflection of the thoughts from your past. Who you will become tomorrow will be based on the thoughts you have today and potentially um, the ones that you pick up if you change some of your thoughts over the next few years. So the difference between the wealthy and the poor or the wealthy and the rest of the population is there is a, it's not that they think even differently, they think opposite to the rest of the population. Your thoughts will decide your level of wealth. A great writer said, as a mind thinks, so it becomes. Meaning that it, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Now that's a, a, a quote from Confucius. It says, whether you think you can or you think you can, you're right. Meaning that your thoughts will become whatever you want them to be. If you think in negative uh, ways, you will attract negative things to your life. If you think positively, you attract positive things to your life. So beliefs and philosophies is where you separate the wealthy from the rest of the population. Now let me share some of them with you because I believe if you can just pick up some of these that it could radically change your life and make a difference. Now, one of the things you've got to understand is who you are today is a, is a reflection of your conditioning. Conditioning. As a matter of fact, who you are today has been formed based on about five different factors. Number one is your environment, the environment you grew up in and the environment you are in right now. Number two are the relationships you have around you. Number three are the events that have occurred in your life, the experiences you've had. Number four, your goals, your dreams of the future. And finally, number five, in most cases, has to do with your self-image. Now, your beliefs are important because, like I said, your beliefs are your thoughts. The thoughts that you believe are true. The thoughts that you believe are true. And it's simply a multitude of thoughts that you've repeated and heard so many times. You know, repeated and repeated and repeated and habitualized thoughts. Classic example, one of the beliefs and the philosophies of the wealthy is, number one, the wealthy don't believe in working for money. The wealthy work, and they believe that working for money is the worst possible way um, to earn a living. They don't believe that work, you go to work to earn money. They believe that you go to work for fun. You go to work for joy. You go to work to express the talents and the gifts and the skills you have and using those to create value for people. They believe, however, that if you're going to work, you should work for investment assets, not for money. You work for profits that come from your investment assets, not for money. The average person works for money. I started by talking about currency. They work for currency. The, the wealthy, on the other hand, work to acquire investments, investment assets that creates an income, and that income then sustains their lifestyle. Now, that's the first one very important belief of the wealthy. I'm going to give you just three. Um, perhaps in keeping with the three options I've used so far on the other two. So the first is actually, you work for investments. Not money. Very important. The second belief. The wealthy believe that wealth is simply... Um, a, a reward. Money is simply a reward for value created for other people. Now, I talked about this earlier on. It's a very basic law of life. They believe that the level of service they provide to other people is always in proportion to what they have. So what they do is they give more service than they get paid for. And because they give more service, they, they apply what we call the law um, of cause and effect, which simply says that there is a, 
a reaction as a result of an action you take. And in most cases, they're sometimes equal and opposite, depending, but also the reaction is guaranteed as long as you take action. Now, in various parts, um, depending on whether you talk about philosophy, whether you talk about religion, it's used differently. You know, the, the philosophers and the scientists will talk about, you know, cause and effect, uh, Newton's law of you know, motion. They have a, a scientific way of explaining it. Now, if you move across to other areas of life, we know that as the law of sowing and reaping, which says whatever you sow, you will reap. So the wealthy understand the importance of creating value. And they focus on creating more value than they get paid for. They don't even focus on compensation. All they're thinking about is how can I solve problems? How can I solve a problem for someone? How can I make a difference? And because they're giving so much, nature, life, gives back to them. It's simply a mindset. Now think about it this way. If you walked into a very beautiful Victorian house, and in the house was a beautiful fireplace. If it was cold and it was in the winter, you could walk up to the fireplace and you could say, um, I'm really cold and it heats. Now, most people, the average, keep saying to the, they look at the fireplace and they say, Mr. Fireplace, Mrs. Fireplace, I have all this wood around. I'm going to give you wood, but you have to give me fire first. I need to get warm which is a wrong way and a very shallow way of thinking. On the other hand, the person with a different mindset comes in and says, I'm going to give all of this wood to the fireplace. And hopefully with time, the wood will be used to create heat and I'll have some warmth. So it's about creating value. The wealthy believe in creating value. Now, the third thing I'm going to talk about in terms of beliefs and philosophies is the purpose of money. The wealthy do not think that the purpose of money is to be spent. The average person thinks the money is simply there to be spent. And therein lies the difference. You see, how you view something decides how you use it. If you value money, then you protect it, you will guard it when you receive it. If, on the other hand, you have no value for money, once you get it, you discard it. Now, part of that principle comes because the poor generally think that money is evil. The money is something to be avoided. Now, I grew up in a, in a, in a, on a Christian um, family umbrella, um, and you could hear so many things from people um, who were misguided in their understanding of the various scriptures. And in so many cases, you had the reference, money is the root of all evil, which in itself is a wrong and a false statement because it's incorrect. But it's, it's a belief, it was repeated so many times that many people automatically saw money as evil. Many people saw money as something to be shunned. Many people saw money as something to be avoided, that if you wanted money, you were greedy. That's one school of thought. I'm not suggesting it's wrong, I'm not suggesting it's right. What I will say is this, money is neither good nor is it evil. Money is simply a multiplier, it makes you more of who you are. If you're kind, money gives you um, a platform to be more kind. If you're, you know, a scrooge, if you're unhappy, it simply magnifies your unhappiness. The wealthy, on the other hand, see money as a, almost like a, a vehicle for making a difference in people's lives. Now think about this. Andrew Carnegie was one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. He was the richest man um, back in the 90s. And at a young age, he had a goal, which I thought was very inspiring. He set a goal, and his goal was simply this. I'm going to spend the first part of my life earning a lot of money. And then I'm going to spend the remaining latter part of my life using the money I've acquired to make a difference in people's lives, to give people the opportunity and the platform um, that they never had. Now, interestingly, this goal was so inspiring 
that he became the wealthiest man in the world. It's estimated that his fortune was almost 80 billion. If you would, if you would convert him to today's currency in terms of purchasing power, it was about 80 billion. And he gave away about 90% of his wealth. Now, part of that was because he had a mindset. He had a thinking that said, money is for sharing. If I have more, I can do more. So the third belief and philosophy that the wealthy have about money is based on how it's used. They see money as good, something that aids them to create a difference in the world. Now that deals with the beliefs, and there's so many I can give you, and I don't think um, I can give you all of it now. I'll give you, let me just say a few of those. You know, one of the beliefs from the wealthy is that your thinking creates wealth. They believe that thinking is the best gift that's been given to anyone, and if you can steal your mind and allow your creativity to soar and use your imagination and apply the questioning process to thinking, because you see, thinking is simply a process of asking questions. They believe by doing that, you come up with an idea. And because money is an idea, all you have to do is take that idea and convert it into a form that people can see, they can see the value, and they'll compensate you. So one of the ways and the beliefs they have, the wealthy have about money is simply, you've got to ask yourself questions. And if you ask empowering questions and you do it repeatedly, which is thinking, you become wealthy. There's so many ways, so many other beliefs. Another belief the wealthy have about money and wealth is simply that you should never, never work for money. And that's in the, from the point of view of exchanging your time, your energy, your presence, your intellect, you're giving all of you, because they have the view that it's, it's limited. Time is limited. What they believe is that you must find a way to leverage your time by engaging with other people in such a way that you can you can achieve more by doing less now like i said there are probably about 20 or 30 beliefs that you might want to consider um if you want to change your life now i covered this in my book unstoppable so you have to you have to get the book you do have to get the book For further information, let me share this with you. For further information on beliefs, let me suggest that you look at chapter number five. Um, chapter number five in the book Unstoppable, because I give you so many great beliefs um, from the wealth. Now, I'll give you a good example. You know, wealth, for example, I say here is wealth is created in your spare time. Um, it's what you do during your spare time that makes you wealthy. If you have an, a normal job, you know, you don't get wealthy working for someone else. Yes, you could get wealthy using a portion of what you earn um, from the job you do. But wealth is created during your spare time, during what we call prime time. You know, between 7 and 11 every evening, what are you doing? After work, what are you doing? Are you thinking? Are you asking questions? Are you studying opportunities? Are you studying wealth? Are you increasing your financial education? Wealth is created at your spare time. I became financially free and wealthy based on what I did during my spare time. So there are many beliefs and philosophies about wealth that you must learn and that the wealthy use to give themselves an advantage. There's so many I can give you. And I believe... Um, that I've kept you for quite a long time now, that is, you know, I may not be able to share all of the various beliefs that are essential to creating wealth. And therefore, get the book. You know, this might seem like a, a regular commercial plug, but there's so much contained in this book that in the next few minutes, I can't do enough justice to this topic. But I believe if you can change the way you think, you change your life. If you want to change your life, change the way you think. And the only way you can change the way you think is by changing your beliefs and your philosophies. Now think about this, for example. Your belief and your beliefs will always precede your performance. Performance comes after your beliefs because you will always act like the person you believe you are, the person you see in your self-image. Um, you always act like the person you think you are. 
And so to become wealthy, first of all, you've got to change the belief. You've got to change that self-concept, that picture you have about yourself. And the way you do this is by changing how you think, which is your philosophy. Now let's move very quickly into the rules of money. And this is where I conclude today's session. The rules of money are simple. Like a game, if you know the rules, you know how to play to, and, and, and win. You can play the game to your advantage. Now the first rule of money is simple. Wealth is a product of your financial intelligence. It's a product of your financial wisdom. So the first rule of money, of wealth or money, is that you must get wisdom. The most important thing, you know, one of the people I admire and someone who is considered to be, or to have been, the wealthiest man who ever lived, was from ancient times. His name was King Solomon. And he has a statement where he says that wisdom is the most important thing. And with all you're getting, get understanding. And he says wisdom is more important than gold and silver. Financial wisdom is not a, a necessity. It's a, it's a fundamental prerequisite to creating wealth. If you lack financial wisdom, you're, you're building your house on a weak foundation. You know, there's a, a, an ancient story of two men who built their houses. And one of them was so passionate and excited about building that he didn't think beyond the season he was in. And so he built his house on the sand because whilst he was building it, it seemed as though everything was okay. The weather was fine, but the other was wise. The second man was wise and he built his house on the rocks. Now the account of the story says that when the wind came and the waves and the water um, and the, they came beating on the houses, that the house built on the rock stood because it was built on a strong foundation. The house on the sand unfortunately collapsed because it was built on a wrong foundation. If you're going to build, create, maintain wealth, financial wisdom is a must. And this is something that has to become a daily experience. You know, the way you feed yourself and you feed your body to grow, every day you have to feed your mind. Wealth is knowledge and wisdom intensive. You have to commit to becoming lifelong in learning. Every day you're in the classroom with wealth. So the first rule is wisdom. You must gain wisdom and you must continue to increase your wisdom. Now, part of the reason for that is what I explained at the start, that if you understand the game, you can win. Many people are playing the game um, and they're amateurs, but they're playing against professionals and they're losing. Now, part of the reason you want wisdom is because wisdom makes you understand taxes. It makes you understand economics. It makes you understand history. It makes you understand um, debts. It makes you see opportunities. It makes you understand risks. It makes you understand um, investments. You see, wisdom is everything. Everything is founded on wisdom. Now, the second rule of money is simply leverage. You, you have to learn how to use leverage. Now, if you think about leverage, if you think about leverage in a fulcrum, if, you've, if you can remember it, Leverage is simply something that allows you to do more with less. So, for example, if you were trying to lift a piece of metal, um, which perhaps based on its size, you cannot carry it yourself. If you were to find an equipment that can enable you to maneuver and move that piece of metal very easily, that is using leverage. Now, leverage is important in the rules because leverage is how the rich get richer. The difference between the poor and the rich in terms of wealth is because the wealthy use leverage. And the way they use leverage is because they have financial wisdom. So leverage and wisdom are connected. As a matter of fact, wisdom is a form of leverage.
wisdom is a form of leverage and so they understand leverage and one of the leverage opportunities they understand and they use is they understand the power of debts debts is how the rich get richer now let me just say this although i'm not talking about that in this session there's a difference between what i call investment debts and what i call debts that you get into for personal reasons investment debts are debts you go into to create more value for people to solve a problem to provide provide a justified solution um, true value for other people and in the process your net worth your wealth worth increases so investment debt is debts that makes you rich personal debts or what i call liability debts are all the debts we get into primarily because we have an instant gratification desire um, and to make it more simple investment debts are debts you're going to acquire assets assets that make you rich assets that give you an income liability or personal debts are debts that make you poor but also they cost you and co cost and they cause money to flow away from you that is leverage leverage debts so the rich and the wealthy use debts to get richer another leverage they use is taxes now this is where i'm going to just spend maybe a few minutes if you don't understand the taxation laws and you don't have a general overview of the taxation laws then i think it will probably be one of the best investments you make for yourself now let's say you disregard everything i've shared with you today perhaps you don't like the way I've presented, perhaps you don't even like me, perhaps you don't like what I say, perhaps you disagree with what I say, maybe you have your own beliefs and you're holding tightly to your beliefs um, rather than asking yourself the question, is what he's saying going to be useful in helping me achieve the dreams? Perhaps you're asking yourself, is what he's saying consistent with what I know already? Let's assume you, you, you discount and disregard everything I've shared with you. If all you did was go with this advice, I think it would have been worth your time. And the advice is simply this. You have to know and have an understanding about taxation and taxes. And why is this important? It's important simply because one of the rules of money, which is connected to leverage, is simply that the wealthy do not work for money. And part of the reason they do not work for money is because when you work for money, you get what we call income various income sources so you have to understand income types you know the income you make from a salary a wage commissions a bonus is what we call active income this means you exchange your time even a company income is active income you create value you exchange time you're compensated on a personal level all of your active income is the highest source of income that is taxable this is where the difference this is where the game changes you see the wealthy work for what we call investment income investment income that produces or rather investment assets and investment income that produces a different form of income we call passive income or portfolio income i'll give you a good example of that this book um, every time I sell a copy, I get an income from it. The income I get is portfolio income. On the other hand, my real estate investments pay me a passive income, different type of income. Now, for my passive and my portfolio income, the taxes I have to pay is much, much less than an average person would have to pay if they were working in a job. So one of the biggest flaws about this working for a living, one of the biggest flaws of the concept is simply because you're slaving yourself to make other people wealthy. Now in London, the UK, we have different taxation levels. On average, on average, most people will spend about 50% of all they earn on taxes. Now, that would include your income tax, 
that would include perhaps you know whatever form of taxes you pay stamp duty that will include what we call value added tax if you buy something you pay a tax but when you add it all together it comes up to on average about 50 percent usually between 40 and 50 irrespective of what you earn now we have a lower bracket of people who, who pay a lower tax taxation you know level you know we have 20 percent 40 percent tax 45 percent and above which will be changing for those making um, 80, you know, I think 80,000 pounds or more. But the point is simply this. The money you earn is taxed at the highest level. I'll give you a classic example. As an, employ as an employee, if I was working as an employee for my company, I would be paying the highest tax bracket level. I'll be paying, I'll be in what is currently the 45% bracket, which will be increasing. Um, on the other hand, as a business owner, same company, I can pay as little as 0% tax because the tax laws are favored in such a way that they, the, the, the entrepreneurs and the business owners are given a lot more incentives to continue to do what they do, create jobs, create housing. And so you can, you can pay as little as 0 the difference is with an ordinary income or active income, the first line of expense, when you earn, the first payment taken from your salary is taxes as an employee. As a business owner, as an entrepreneur, um, and this is where the wealthy people capitalize on this knowledge. As a business or as an entrepreneur, your taxes are the last expenses you pay so you can make all the money you want you can take the money and reinvest the money creating more wealth and at the last minute whatever is left you pay taxes now that gives the wealthy what i call an unfair advantage but guess what the knowledge is there for everyone it's not restricted to a small group of people anyone can participate in in, in using the same taxation opportunities you just have to have the financial wisdom required so i've given you two wisdom and leverage now i talked about income and i was saying that the wealthy do not work for income they work for assets and those assets they allow those assets to create passive income the passive income they create pays the least amount of taxes and that makes them a lot more um, um makes them a lot more wealthy 